Hello and welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast, where we explore the myths and legends of Northern Europe from an archetypal perspective. I'm Luke DeWolf. And I'm Dan Larrabee. Today, we're excited to have Dr. Jackson Crawford uh, with us on the show today. And you might know him as the translator of our version of the Poetic Edda that we read on the show. We're, of course, super grateful for uh, getting to use this translation. And uh, if you've been following along with us, you know that uh, it's been, you know, really, really well written. And it's been a lot of fun to dive into it as we've been covering it on the show. Before we uh, invite uh, Dr. Crawford onto the show here today, just a, a couple of things. If you'd like to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter as Northern Myths. And we're on Instagram and YouTube under Northern Myths Podcast. And uh, beyond that, am I forgetting anything, Dan? Just that uh, you and I are both on Twitter ourselves at North Myth Luke and at North Myth Dan. Exactly. So if you'd like to follow us on social media, we love having conversations with people. And we always appreciate it uh, if you're willing to share our show on social media or subscribe on our YouTube channel. And uh, without much further ado here, I'll just give a little introduction to Dr. Crawford. He's an instructor and director of Nordic Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's also a translator of Old Norse literature, including the Poetic Edda and a number of sagas as well. And he's got a popular YouTube channel, which of course we'll link to in our description and podcast notes. And uh, with all that, uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Crawford. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, it's uh, it, it really is. Uh, we're we're happy to be uh, talking with you here, of course, because your translation of the Poetic Edda is uh, well. Without that, our, our show would uh, it, it would have taken a lot longer to get off the ground, anyway. So, thank you for letting us use it. I'm very honored, and uh, I'm glad that uh, that was able to work out with uh, with my publisher and everything. Oh, of course. And, uh, you know, we're, we're certainly very happy that you have developed this translation and it's incredibly readable, uh, before we, because of course we want to, we talk a little bit about the, uh, the edda itself. Uh, can you just go, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, go into a little more detail, anything that we missed? Well, I think you hit the high points <laughs> such as they are. Um, yeah, I teach at the University of Colorado. I've been here since 2017. Uh, I've been very happy to be back because I'm from the Rocky Mountains originally. So that's been a, an exciting homecoming for me. Uh, before this, um, I got my PhD in Scandinavian studies, focusing on Old Norse and the history of the Scandinavian languages at the University of Wisconsin. Then I taught at UCLA for three years and at Berkeley for two uh, before I found myself here. Yeah, it's quite the quite the journey, and I suppose. Well, we we're also kind of Rocky Mountain. Well, not 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 exactly, but we're we're adjacent, kind of in the foothills. So I think we can appreciate the the enjoyment of that sort of climate and landscape. Oh, absolutely! Uh, it is. It's it's made a big difference to just my I don't know mood or or general state of life uh, to be back in you know kind of my country, right? Um, I've, I've missed the mountains a lot. And after being in, you know, school as a student and then as an instructor in all these different places and never really having much of a choice of where I was at, it's been nice to have this coincidental uh, homecoming. Because, of course, I had no idea I'd ever wind up back here. Uh, the way academic jobs work, you just go where there's a job. So it's uh, just a nice coincidence. No, I've seen um, videos on your your YouTube channel of all the the places you go in in Colorado and and Wyoming, and it definitely seems like uh, you're you're at home there. Yeah, it's been wonderful, and of course, you know, I know the uh, I know the back roads a little bit, so I get to show you folks some places that uh, that are a little bit off the beaten path, which is always nice. Uh, where exactly are you from originally? Colorado, Wyoming. Well, it's kind of complicated. I was actually born in Texas, but uh, my father is in the oil business and uh, my grandparents were in the mountains of Colorado. And uh, so I moved around quite a bit with my parents, um, kind of all up and down the Rocky Mountain region. 
Um, but my grandparents' house in Colorado was kind of my like anchor, the home base amid all this moving around. So that was kind of my most stable place. Um, and so growing up, I identified mostly with Colorado and then also with Wyoming, which uh, I just always liked the the spirit and, and place of. Yeah, Wyoming is uh, spectacular. I was through Wyoming a few years ago and uh, e- even just driving through, I was like, geez, I could live here. This is amazing. Yeah, there is uh, there is a wonderfully low population density. And, you know, it's, it's good people. Um, all the most beautiful places are at least two hours from any interstate, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is, you know, helps, helps, uh, the people who are there want to be there. And, uh, this is kind of a, uh, a Wyoming spirit that I find, um, t- to be kind of, uh, tough, but joyous, which I think is also a spirit that you get out of uh, a lot of the sagas. Absolutely. And that, that actually sort of leads into our, one of our first questions is, how did how did you get uh, involved in the sagas? How did what was it about Norse mythology that inspired you to sort of take the career path that you have? Oh well, it was pretty indirect. Uh, I was really into dinosaurs as a kid, uh, so I really wanted to be a paleontologist for most of my youth. And uh, one of my best friends wound up becoming a paleontologist. Um, but somewhere along there, I think in seventh grade. I uh, had to choose what language I was going to do. And uh, the school I was at at the time had Latin. And I decided to do Latin because all the dinosaur names were Latin. And um, from Latin, I noticed that language evolved kind of like animals do. And I got really interested in how Latin had evolved into a language I heard spoken around me, Spanish. Um, So I thought, oh, let me see what English comes from. And so I started self-studying uh, Old English, and uh, that led me to Old Norse, which is quite similar. And I got really interested in Old Norse as what I like to call a forgotten sister of English. Because if you're approaching it from an English or Old English perspective, you see a familiar language, but one that has undergone uh, certain changes that our language hasn't, or has made certain choices from alternatives that we didn't, uh, or that has kept older features that we didn't. So I think forgotten sister is, is a, a useful term for that. And, uh, then of course, being, uh, in, in grad school studying old Norse, of course, there's so much literature to read. And, uh, so I gained a pretty good command, a pretty good familiarity with everything, the Eddas, the sagas, um, which I had already liked a little bit. I remember also in middle school, um, the first thing I ever read from Old Norse literature was the Havamal, and um, I really liked it. That's had an appeal to me since I was, how old would I have been when I first read that? I was probably 11. Um, and so that's really stuck with me. But then I also began reading, you know, some of the sagas, especially the saga of the Volsungs has always had a, a, a special place in my heart, I suppose. Uh, a lot of the other poems in the Poetic Edda. Uh, so I've always kind of swum in these to a degree, but then of course in grad school, you know, getting a PhD in old Norris, I mean, you're reading this stuff all the time. I've read who knows how many, I'm sure thousands of times I've read <laughs> of them all and hundreds of times, other Eddic poems and sagas. Um, and so then of course, when you're getting into uh, teaching, if you're lucky enough to do that, uh, you can't just teach old Norse language. You're going to be teaching old Norse literature. You're going to be teaching Vikings history classes, mythology classes, and things like that. So, uh, that, uh, of course began when I was teaching, uh, as a grad student at the university of Georgia, then at the university of Wisconsin, then finally as faculty at UCLA, uh, Berkeley and Colorado. So essentially you started the journey through language in general and your, your interest in, in language. And from there it spawned out into kind of the, the history, the mythology and everything that you've done as far as translate translations and stuff, that's all started with your original interest in, in languages that started with Latin? Yes. So I, I am a, a linguist by academic background. Um, my master's, so my, my undergrad degree is actually in Latin and Greek. And then, um, my master's degree is in historical linguistics. And then for my PhD, I specialized in basically the historical linguistics of Scandinavian. Um, 
So if you look at my master's thesis, I was looking at um, uh, some of the, the syntax of uh, certain words in um, uh, early modern Icelandic. And then in my uh, doctoral dissertation, I looked at uh, the history of how color is categorized in the Scandinavian languages, especially in uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, so most of my academic work is very linguistic in focus. But this also led me to being pretty dissatisfied with a lot of current translations, because as a linguist, I'm pretty sensitive to issues of how you're rendering one language in another. And I thought that uh, a, a huge problem that Old Norse translations into English and into other languages like modern Scandinavian languages uh, suffer from is that they are often very uh, slavish to the word order of the Old Norse, which is pretty different from English or a language like Norwegian or Swedish today. So you end up with sentences that read really artificial and don't have any feeling for that reason, because as soon as you're, you're dealing with a language that is recognizably your own, but different enough that you can't naturally produce it, think of something like Shakespeare, you're spending so much time decoding it that you're not reacting to the content. So essentially what happened was the first year I was teaching Norse mythology classes at uh, UCLA in uh, 2011, I just had to spend so much time in class explaining the translation they had read that I thought I've got to do this myself just so I don't have to spend all this time explaining it. We can actually talk about the text. Um, so I started by translating uh, the most, what I thought were the, well, the, the poems I talked about the most. So I did Volusball, Hovmall, um, Locusena, uh, and the heroic poems I remember started with Atlakvila because that's the oldest and, and has the most self-contained narrative. And I sort of built out from that. Um, and once I had about a half dozen of them, I had uh, recently done a, uh, a a book review of a translation that had come from Hackett uh, that I've been very positive about. And I wrote to them and I said, would you be interested in starting with some Old Norse translations? And that's uh, where my translations were born. Oh, that's fa fantastic. And well, certainly your your background in linguistics makes you the ideal person to attempt a translation with uh, linguistics is, is sort of a side interest of, of mine. And I ended up uh, my first year in university, I was a major in linguistics. And I feel like if you had been been around when I was in, uh, in university, I, I might not have abandoned uh, linguistics so quickly for the, the apparent lack of, of jobs that seem to be available. But uh, oh, it's, it's not just an apparent lack of jobs. <laughs> Well, yeah, then, <laughs> then, then, fair enough. But your uh, your success certainly with the the translation and the the YouTube has been uh, certainly uh, really cool to see that kind of come along there. And uh, and of course, everything that you're you're kind of doing with the the linguistics and the translation is something that I'm personally interested in. I like the the fact that you mentioned sort. You obviously seem to to go away from the approach of the more hyper literal translations. That uh, well, one example would be the the Lee Hollander translation, which even went so far as to try and maintain the poetic meter as far as possible, if I if I understand it correctly, right? But yeah. you, you, you've certainly attempted to to translate everything so that it's actually clear and readable. How did that process kind of work? How how were you making decisions between, you know, something that would maybe sacrifice the literal, the hyper literal meaning of, of stanza and then turn it into something that is actually readable, but still maintains the meaning, if that makes sense. Well, if we're, if we're comparing to other translations, I would actually not call Hollander's very literal. Um, he makes so many sacrifices to maintain that meter and the alliteration that at times his translation is actually much less literal than mine uh, because he's having to sacrifice to the, to the meter and, and, and alliteration. And some other translators before him, uh, Bellows comes up, Bray comes up. Uh, they're making decisions along those lines too. And sometimes there's also, uh, of course, you know, every translator swims in his or her own cultural current. Um, one, I think it's the Bray translation, which uh, is sort of popular on the internet. Uh, for example, I know there's, I think, I think it's the Bray translation that translates the word uh, manvit from Hovamal. Um, as 
uh, mother wit, which in uh, late 19th century English in England apparently has um, kind of a sense of common sense. But I translate that as, I think, just intelligence is typically what I say. And so there were some early comments uh, that I saw online, something like, oh, you know, you're taking away this, this feminist angle that's there. This is the, the mother wit. Um, and I remember back when I still, back when there were still so few internet comments that I could respond to, them, um, I remember saying, you know, actually, there's nothing about mothers here. Uh, I've just translated it in the neutral way that it's originally intended. So there's also, you know, there's some of these cultural things. I'm trying to be very neutral culturally. Um, if, if a word doesn't have some kind of emotional resonance, I try not to translate it as a word that has a lot of emotional resonance. If I think it does have some emotional resonance for the original audience, I try to translate it as a more emotional word. Um, that can get difficult with words that are meant to be insulting because of course you can choose words that are very insulting in modern English, but then you risk alienating a lot of the audience just because... It's so jarring to see those words. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's delicate. Um, typically what I do is, uh, you know, I'm working on my third book right now, working on translating uh, the saga of Rolf Kraki and the saga of Herborn Haderich. So I'll have my, my old Norse text, um, either in a physical book or uh, especially when I was working on the Eddas, I was uh, working a lot from the uh, high quality scans of the original manuscript of Codex Regius that the Audi Magnuson Institute makes available. Well, that's uh, that's excellent, by the way. Just oh, that's thank really you. cool that you got to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's a great uh, great reason to live in the 2010s. <laughs> I don't have to go to Iceland to, to just have a great high quality look at this. Um, although I have held that manuscript, so I've got the, the Old Norse um, in one corner of my eye, and I'm going through it. And um, one thing that I'm also kind of trying to do is read it as much as I can as, as someone who's been reading old Norris for, I don't know, at least 15 years. Um, you know, I'm, I'm probably as quote, as close to quote unquote fluent in it as one can be in a language. That there's nobody to talk to him. So I'm trying to kind of like read an old Norris first and say like, where are the natural pauses in this to me? I'm, I'm trying as much as I can. If I'm looking at a modern um, printing of the old Norse text, to kind of ignore what the modern editor inserts as far as punctuation, because there's barely any punctuation in Old Norse manuscripts. Um, trying to ignore that, trying to ignore where modern editors are going to put paragraphs. Of course, this is no problem if you're looking at the manuscript, but I can't always do that. Um, and just say, okay, where, what feels like a natural pause? What, what feels like um, something that, that's emotionally charged? What feels like a question? Because actually Old Norse word order um, is not always consistent about what a question looks like, like English can be. Um, so, and then, and then turn that into something that I feel represents both uh, literally and to the degree that I can kind of emotionally what uh, the old Norse text says. So one thing that I think happens with the, the older style translators is that they're using such old fashioned language that the emotion doesn't emerge for a modern reader. Right. We don't have uh, particularly strong emotional connections to, you know, Shakespearean language. Uh, it, 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 it's because it's just so unnatural to us. But I'm trying to kind of, you know, if a conversation feels faster, I'm going to try to use more contractions in modern English, for example, because, of course, if this was a fast paced conversation in English, I'd probably be using a lot of contractions, um, probably a lot of progressive verb tenses, which if you read older fashioned translators, they're not using a lot of of progressive verb uh, forms in English. And that, that's part of what makes it seem stilted, right? So I might write, uh, I'm speaking to you, Loki, rather than, you know, speak I now to you, Loki. Part of what seems stilted in English is the word order, but part of what seems stilted is just that you're not using the progressive, right? I'm speaking, you're saying I speak or speak I or something like that. That's an interesting, uh, interesting distinction that, that I don't think I'd ever uh, considered the the reason why these older translations feel so well distant or uh, well unemotional. That's a that's a good way of putting it. I, I hadn't considered it like that. It just I, I knew that they were harder to read. That's all. Sure. So um, you know, let me let me think about uh, an actual example. I'm, I'm using this. I'm speaking to you now, Loki, but. Uh, uh, let me think if I, if I can think of a, a good example of an actual sentence. 
uh, from somewhere. You know what? Let me just pull up on my computer right here. I'll just grab. Uh, let me let me look at what I'm working at right now. What chapter of Rolf Saga? How about that? And I'll, sounds great. I'll give you kind of a, a look at my process. Let me just pull this up right now. Well, while you do that, I'll just mention that uh, having read all of the uh, the older translations, it actually was with uh, with your translation where I actually found the uh, like reading the Voluspa and reading about uh, the death of Balder and the death of Odin. I actually I did feel the emotional connection there, whereas before I hadn't really. It was like okay, so they're dead, and this is doing this, but now it was like oh no, it's like this is a big deal. Yeah. So I, it's neat to hear that you you consciously try to do that. Well, I, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, the the thing is, you can. I think part of what's affected a lot of these older translators too is that Old Norse and Old English, and even Old Norse and early modern English share so much basic vocabulary that it's very tempted to go word by word and use exact equivalents. But those exact linguistic like, well, etymological equivalents, those cognates are not necessarily going to be um, actual equivalents in terms of usage. Uh, so I just pulled up the chapter I'm working on of Rolf Saga right now, and I found, I think, a good um, example of this phenomenon. And I can send you the Old Norse uh, text and writing too, so you can see what I'm looking at. Let me see if I can just do this on Skype. See if this works. Okay. Og þú ert nú komin her, svip dagar felagi, eða hvert mun erndit kappans. So if I go word by word, uh, and I'm using exact cognates from uh, from English, I would get, and thou art now come here, svip dag companion, or whether will the errand of the champion. So word by word, um, you can see that these are often words that are cognate with English, often exactly, uh, thou art now come here through er new common hair. Uh, Felagi is actually cognate with fellow. I could have used that instead of companion. Mm. Um, Errandy is as errand. But this doesn't seem very natural in English, though, an early translator might just leave it exactly like I've done here, or, or probably maybe say Swift Dog Fellow instead of Swift Dog Companion because of the cognate. Okay, in English today, we don't say uh, you are come, we say you have come, hmm. right? And it's no injury to the translation to translate this into how actually people say it because you're not drawing attention to the language, you're drawing attention to what's happening. So, and you've come here, uh, Swift dog, um, you know, we, we don't typically say something like swift dog companion. We might say my companion swift dog, right? Flip the, the word order a little bit. Mm. And then Old Norse has a tendency uh, where if you have a statement followed by a question, you insert the word whether before the question, even if it's not a choice between two things, right? In, in modern English, we'll say whether... Um, uh, tell me whether you want to get, um, you know, barbecue or tie today, where there's a choice of two things. But Old Norse also uses the word whether as a transition from a statement to a question. Right? We have no equivalent to that. And since there is no equivalent in English, we do just switch straight from a statement to a question. What I would do is I'd put a period there. And now you've come here, my companion swift dog. And then the question is a separate sentence, that's just how we phrase it in English. What will be the champion's errand, right? Or what is the champion's errand? Um, you don't have to follow, you don't have to translate one word in the Old Norse for one word in the English um, because that just gets you stilted English. You have to look, you have to look at the whole at what's, what's conveyed by the words in the Old Norse and how that's conveyed in English um, and sometimes change the syntax because that's actually just how we say the same things. And of course, that does take reading a lot of Old Norse and knowing what these, these things mean. I mean, you have to read a fair amount of Old Norse to say, you know what, they do this a lot, where there's a statement followed by a question, they use the word whether, even though there's no choice between two things there. It's just how they transition from a statement to a question. Um, 
we don't do that, so we don't have to translate a word there. That's a fascinating look into into your process, and uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, definitely a very uh, very enlightening in how how you work and how you've you've made your translation work. I I was going to ask, but it, you sort of already did. Uh, how to what degree are you able to just read Old Norse and effectively understand it fluently? But obviously, that's that's very much uh, very much the case. I suppose uh, Icelandic would be the the closest thing to a, a modern equivalent of uh, of old norse right but i would i would assume you can't just go into reykjavik and and start speaking old norse with proper pronunciation and the exact grammar and have people understand you perfectly right well uh, I've, I've sort of experimented with this um when i was first learning modern icelandic i tried to do that a lot more because you know there's this whole narrative of icelandic that gets sold as it's basically Old Norse. Um, it's it's not identical. Um, so after I'd learned modern Icelandic pronunciation, um, I was in Iceland taking some classes at the University of Iceland in uh, 2007. And when I first got there, uh, I was mystifying some people with just how weirdly old fashioned I sounded. Because of course, you know, vocabulary has changed in 800 years. Um, Icelandic has remained, it's a very conservative language overall. So it has not changed as much in 800 years as English has, say. But speaking Old Norse on the streets of Reykjavik is kind of like if, um, you know, you had called me on Skype and um, you had to deal with me speaking to you in Shakespearean English with Shakespeare's pronunciation, right? And if you've never heard what Shakespeare's pronunciation would sound like, uh, search for that on YouTube. It's His accent was something we would probably consider sort of Irish sounding. So it's, it's a little, it's, it's jarring. It's weird. You sound kind of artificial and old fashioned. Um, but if you know the grammar of old Norse, well, um, learning modern Icelandic is not a huge challenge and vice versa, but you'll find a lot of things that are, that are different. For instance, for example, I mentioned the progressive tense in English. Um, right. This is just something we do in modern English. Instead of saying, um, you know, if someone asks me what I'm doing, they don't say, what do you? And I don't respond, I speak with my brother. They ask, what are you doing? Right, the progressive tense. And I respond, I'm speaking with my brother. Hmm. Part of, again, this is something that comes up with translators because they're going in such an automatic word by word translation that they translate these things as, what do you or what do you do? And they respond, I speak with. I'm going to translate that, what are you doing? And I'm speaking with because it's just normal modern English. Um, but modern Icelandic has made the same transition. So in um, in Old Norse, where you would typically say ek, kem, I come, in modern Icelandic, you are more likely to say yeg era, coma, I am coming. So there's also some tactic differences. The words are the same, but they're used in different um, uh, in, in different in different constructions and different chains. Um, of course, if you've only read Old Norse, there's going to be a lot of vocabulary you're missing in modern Icelandic because the word for axe doesn't come up that much, but the word for bus comes up pretty frequently, right? Um, so it's not, it's not a perfect guy, but definitely they help with each other. I make a pretty big effort to keep them separate because at um, Berkeley, I taught modern Icelandic and um, keeping them separate helps for me, my old Norse be better old Norris and my modern Icelandic be better modern Icelandic. And that's part of why I, somewhat uniquely for uh, English language teachers of the language use reconstructed Old Norse pronunciation is because I'm, I'm deliberately trying to keep them separate in my head. But also as a linguist, when I talk about how sounds change, um, I confuse myself if I talk about Old Norse like it was pronounced as modern Icelandic. I want to think about how it was pronounced at the time the sagas were written uh, so I can keep in mind what what's going on linguistically. You know, How is the sound being rounded by this thing? Uh, or, or something like that. That's maybe not a phenomenon that's present in modern Icelandic. No, well, it's a, uh, it makes a great uh, you make a great point there in, in terms of the reconstructed pronunciation. And I know a little bit about how reconstructions work based on how languages are pronounced in the the modern era and where where we have um, record anyway of of older pronunciations, but are, are we fairly confident in, uh, in how Old Norse would have been 
pronounced in, say, the year 1000, something like that? Yes, I'd say we're more confident with Old Norse than with your average extinct language. Um, we have several lines of evidence with Old Norse. Um, for one thing, we have modern descendant languages. So we've got um, direct descendants in the form of uh, Icelandic Faroese and uh, most Norwegian dialects. We have nearly direct descendants in the forms of Swedish and Danish. Of course, they're from uh, Old East Norse, which isn't the dialect that, say, the Eddas are written in, but uh, is very close. And uh, having all those descendants is very helpful for linguists because um, particular changes are just statistically much more likely over time. So if we see that, um, you know, take, take five of these languages, Icelandic, Faroese, Norwegian, Swedish, and Danish. If we see that four of them say have changed, um, a G to a Y, but one of them keeps that G, um, and we say, okay, which one is the old pronunciation? The G is actually more likely because over time in languages, we frequently observe Gs becoming Ys. I can't think of a single time we've ever seen Ys turn into Gs. So that helps us with kind of saying, all right, this is probably the older pronunciation and, and triangulating a little bit from the, the current languages. Guard to yard being one of the common examples of that one, right? Yeah, English has that exact same change. Um, and in fact, the places where we have G before front vowels, get, give, um, words like that typically come from Old Norse before Old Norse had undergone that change. Um, and then another line of evidence we have about the pronunciation that's very good is skaldic poetry, uh, because it is so demanding in terms of what can rhyme with what, um, what has to alliterate with what, that we get a very good idea of what alliterates and what rhymes. And it's not the exact same scheme as you get reading them in, say, modern Icelandic. So we start seeing, oh, this is a different vowel than this because these two words never rhyme. But these two words had the same vowel at the time. Um, these two words can alliterate with each other. So clearly this was the same consonant pronunciation, but these two never alliterate with each other. So they weren't pronounced the same at this time. So that helps a lot. And then um, also we have the so-called first grammatical treatise, a uh, book written in the 1140s by an unknown author in Iceland who uh, proposed some changes to how Icelandic was written in the Roman alphabet saying, uh, we have all these vowel sounds, um, that just aren't represented by the Roman alphabet. Uh, and he describes them. He says, you know, this one is made with the tongue retracted in the mouth and the lips rounded and things like that. And actually describes basically how to make these sounds in a very, uh, surprisingly, uh, modern way. And also shows words that are distinguished. Um, you know, uh, people will think you're saying this if you just write it this way, but we need a new vowel letter so we can show that, you know, this word is different from this word, um, setting up minimal pairs that are distinguished by these, these, um, not new, but these sort of unrecognized vowel sounds. Uh, and that's actually where a lot of our conventional writing of Old Norse comes from with the O with the hook, the O with the slash, the A and E written together. Cause those are indicating vowels that just aren't indicated by your, your base, uh, five vowel Roman alphabet. No, oh, that's a, uh, I, I never knew about the, uh, well, the, what was it? The grammatical treatise? Yeah. First grammatical treatise, uh, here, I'll type it out to you on Skype and there is a good edition of it. If you want to look at it by Hreiten Benediktsson. Ah, oh, that's, uh, that's fantastic. I, I never knew about, about that and, or, or about exactly how you could use called the poetry to, uh, to reconstruct that those are the, the the other side of it where the the comparison with modern descendants is is the the standard way but having those extra resources that must be really helpful it is and, and of course there's little things that people that you know we can never be 100 percent sure of or things that change over time so people can get confused um i you know i, I know that i one thing people ask me about is because i always pronounce old nurse v as a v um my particular unique perspective is that it's mostly a V, but after another consonant like HV, SV, TV, I think it's a W sound. So I think, for instance, HVAT is hot, not fat, but I think VATN is vatan. Um, this is similar to how some Afrikaans dialects um, 
distribute these sounds. Um, this is based on um, how these sounds pattern in some uh, Northern Danish dialects and in some Eastern Icelandic accents. But I do think originally those Vs, where those Vs are, there was a W, but I think that by the Viking age, at least in West Norse, they have become a V. So sometimes people say, oh, shouldn't this be a W? And I'm like, well, you know, language is constantly changing. It depends on where you're targeting. If you're looking at 800s Danish, which is the version of Old Norse that was mostly interacting with English. Yes, I think it was a W. If you're looking at the language that the Eddas are written in, the Icelandic of the 1200s, I think it's a V, except after consonants. Um, so there's also those nuances there. And um, of course, for communicating on the internet, those nuances usually get kind of lost, but um, you know that it, it's, it's just something you have to keep in mind that you're looking at the past, but the past also has passed. And so you have to kind of make clear where your past is. You know, it, it's it's funny you mention uh, you get people from the internet, uh, you know, sort of trying to correct you sometimes. And I would I would figure most most uh, most smart people would uh, defer to your expertise, but that doesn't seem to be the case all the time, right? Well, it depends. I mean, I, I the thing that people most quote unquote correct me about is pronunciation. They say, "Oh, this should be pronounced like." And, and of course, they're always trying to correct me to modern Icelandic. So pretty much every video, I have a little note, and I've rephrased this probably 15 times, just a little note that says, I am deliberately using reconstructed pronunciation. This is not the same as modern Icelandic. Look at my videos. I have a bunch of videos about this. But there's always going to be people complaining, as, as if I don't know the modern Icelandic pronunciation. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it gets old, but that's just the internet. Everybody's got to there's, I mean, I guess it's not just the internet, it's life, but it, it comes out on the internet a lot. People just have to, if they know something, they've got to say it and, and, and they like, they like correcting people. Um, Definitely. Sometimes I think, you know, it's, isn't it Alexander Pope who says, uh, little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pierian spring. It's always the people who have studied a little bit that are like, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, but if you actually dig deep. The thing is, there's like five different answers and it depends on what you're talking about. Are you talking about Icelandic in the 1200s? Are you talking about Danish in the 800s? Are you talking about Icelandic today? Those are all three different answers and I'm trying to make clear that mostly I'm talking about Icelandic in about the 1200s. For sure. Just going back to the uh, skaldic poetry for a second, I'm curious as to how you uh, would translate uh, kennings. Well, in translating for uh, my Edda and Saga translations, I have typically just just fully, tra what I call fully translate them. Um, Edic poetry actually doesn't have a ton of kinnings. Uh, skaldic poetry uses them uh, liberally. Uh, Edic poetry, not too much. And one goal that Hackett, my, my publisher, had and I uh, that, that we had when we were talking about the Poetic Edda in the first place was we didn't want to have any end notes or footnotes. We wanted it to be something you could read without be, you could get the content out of without being distracted by the form. And I essentially said, you know, Kinnings makes sense as an artifact of the Norse poet's art. If you're reading Norse poetry as poetry in the original language, uh, mostly the kinning represents a way that you're getting around some requirement to alliterate. You know, of course, um, you can't say Thor because uh, you don't need a th sound. You don't need to rhyme with an, with an or. You need to alliterate with a V. So instead you call him Vithris Arvi, uh, the heir of Vithrir. And Vithrir is another obscure Haiti for Odin. Um, you know, but then you also get your alliteration. You're not, you're not a literation. Maybe you're rhyme with Arv and your alliteration with a V. Uh, so they really reflect the, the crossword like nature of the requirements of skaldic poetry. You put that into English, translating that word by word. And what you get is just a word soup that doesn't convey the content. Well, you have to use a ton of end notes or footnotes or asterisks or parentheses or something like that. Um, you know, it's, it's appreciable in the original, but in English, it just looks weird and it's difficult to duplicate in a translation. So I mostly just decide I will quote fully translate these. Um, but when I think I can kind of get away with it without making it too unclear, I'll often 
borrow like a word from the kinning uh, in the translation. So if, for instance, there's a kinning for Odin that's something like, um, oh, let me think. Oh, oh, I can't remember the exact word of this, but um, something with weapon, like weapon father or something like that. I might put in, you know, instead of just saying Odin, I might say weapon loving Odin or something like that to, to keep a word uh, that kind of colors the kinning. But the exact words of the kinning are just going to be confusing for most readers in English. Is my personal take on that. Yeah, that, that's interesting because I remember uh, in, in a few I in a few of the Edic poems where there there are kennings. Um, you had translated like the the kenning word for word, and it was pretty clear. And it was like uh, I think they, they they mentioned one that's like. Uh, crow feeder or like carry basically someone who's going to die in battle kind of thing. Or um, I know with, uh, with some of uh, Odin's adventures, you, you'll give the uh, like the hooded one rather than Grimnir. Right. Yeah. With, and with, it, it makes sense because it, yeah, his names, if his names are easily understandable in Old Norse, I turn them into something that's easily understandable in English because they always seem like they're kind of jokes about how easy it actually is to recognize him. Um, For sure. <laughs> and if you watch, um, you know, on my YouTube channel, I've gone through uh, Hovamal, Volspa, and now I'm going through Grimnismal uh, word by word and explaining what they mean in Old Norse. I'm not explaining my translation. I'm explaining the original. Um, and those videos take a lot of work. Um, <laughs> but no doubt. If, if you watch those, um, you'll notice there's really not a ton of kinnings to explain in these, these Attic poems. There's, there's a couple but it's not a big deal in, in Attic poetry. It's really in Skaldic poetry where they're just chock full of kinnings because the requirements are so strict for rhyme and alliteration that you almost can't use normal vocabulary. Um, so the real challenge for translating kinnings is for people who are translating uh, Icelandic sagas, sagas of Icelanders, like Gisli saga or Egil saga or something like that, because the hero is a Skaldic poet and just has you know, dozens uh, of these that it breaks out into. And it can be really tough to translate that in a way that, that conveys the poetry, but also conveys what he's saying. Uh, when what he's saying is deliberately obscure to an old Norse audience. <laughs> <laughs> so that can be, well, that could be tough. Yeah. That, <laughs> I, I, I didn't know about the, the rhyming requirement in Skaldic poetry. I knew about the alliteration, but not the rhyming. So I, that, that just complicates it. Oh even yeah. Further. Edic, edic poetry is just alliteration. Skaldic poetry. There's a, there's a rhyme requirement in each line. Uh, I have a video called The Art of Norse Poetry, I think, where I explain the requirements of Skaldic poetry, and it takes about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and your, your videos uh, where you're going through Havmobil Uspa, Grimness Malnau, th those have been fascinating, very uh, very helpful for us, even though I, I think uh, yours on, on Grimness Mal started coming out after we had already done it from our perspective, but uh, you, you know we, we've already learned so much since the process of starting our uh, our show up maybe uh, in another couple of years we'll go back and revisit it with the uh, the newfound uh, knowledge from uh, from your expertise that uh, can go into the the what well, word by word sort of thing. So those have been really really fun to to see. Are, are you going to be doing more of those videos past Grimness Mall? Uh, we'll see. Uh, the problem with them is you know when you when you look at a ten minute video on my YouTube channel, often three hours of work went into preparing for that and editing that, not to mention just me going wherever I went to film it. Um, but for the, the deep dives on the edit poems, I mean, you can triple that time. Um, cause I'm making sure that I'm going to have something to say about pretty much every word. Um, and then also putting the text in and, and I turn it into runes cause so many people ask me about that. Um, so it's been a ton of work. <laughs> And those videos have gotten pretty low uh, viewerships. They've got a dedicated but small audience. So I think I'll probably continue it, but kind of slow. Um, I recently had a request to do uh, Baldur's Dreams next. And I think that would actually not be bad because I could probably do that in one video. It's pretty short. After that, I'll probably pull my Patreon supporters again and, and see what they want me to do next. Um, Grievous Mall, I did. I, I knew I was going to do Hulk Mall by first, but then I pulled my Patreon supporters to see what they wanted next, and it was Green and Small. Um, and of course, Green and Small, it's, it's got a lot. 
Uh, it's where we really get um, our most solid information about stuff like Valhol, uh, Yggdrasil, and of course we also get Odin's names, which are forthcoming in my last installment of Grimness Mall. You know, uh, the funny thing about that is uh, for, for us, even beyond just the the content, the the mythological content that gets introduced there, we, we found Grimness Mall to be just a fascinating symbolic story and and uh, so it's interesting that uh, that your audience as well was was also requesting that possibly for the the mythological content but I, I think that's one of our our favorite poems even even to this day so yeah and it's and it's noticeable that it is the it's the other time that Odin gets tortured for uh, a unit of nine days or nights um right at cousin Hovmal when he sacrificed himself that's nine nights um I think in Grimness Mall, when he's tortured between the two fires, it's it says it's nine days or nine nights. I can't remember if it's days or nights, it says. Um, so he gets, it, it's interesting that you have this chief god who routinely uh, suffers severely and um, seems also to either learn from doing so as in Hall Mall or to, to, to teach after doing so as in Grimness Mall. Yeah, it, sa- it says something about the rewards of uh, of making sacrifices. Yeah, when you know when I was in um, in undergrad, um, I had very little funds, <laughs> as people many people will relate to from the college experience, and I was on the smallest meal plan. And so, one of my first days in college, I calculated how many times I could eat. And I could eat six days a week was my conclusion. I could have basically six meals in a week. So I decided I was going to have a big breakfast six days a week. And that was going to be my eating. Um, and uh, so I had to choose a day not to eat. And I decided not to eat on Wednesday because, of course, that's Odin's day. And Odin also suffered for knowledge. So that was my my small moment of solidarity with Odin. <laughs> oh, that's that's perfect. Oh, wow. I, I think uh, well, and that actually kind of dovetailed to the next couple of things we're we're looking to to ask you about. I wanted to just uh, make the observation that that your Havamal is just far and away the the easiest Havamal to to read. And if you if you say that you uh, you started reading that when you were uh, you said eleven or something like that, uh, I mean that that sort of uh, explains. It. I don't really have a question, but your your Havamal is just so much easier to read than many of these other translations and uh um well if if i'm turning it into a question maybe something like uh how did you get the havamal to that state when it, it it's it's often such uh, an abstract um concepts that they're that they're dealing with how did you produce something like that well um let me think i i guess i haven't um thought about my specific history with havamal uh, too much. I, I would have first read it when I was 11. I do remember that. Um, I read some, cause what I read was Edith Hamilton's mythology. Do you know that book? Heard of it. It's pretty popular in like high school classes, but, uh, I had a class in seventh grade that was called, um, adolescent literature, which was basically just an hour where you could read. And, um, the, uh, classroom monitor, I guess she wasn't exactly a teacher since there was no structured class. Um, she said, you know, oh, we don't, I don't want you reading teen books. I want you reading, um, the classics. I'm going to, I'm going to give you like a classical education because you, you need that. And I said, okay, just tell me what to read. And so she had me read Edith Hamilton's mythology and it's mostly about Greek and Roman myth, but it has a, um, almost a postscript about Norse myth. And uh, she spends a little bit of time talking about Havamal and she quotes from it in English. I think it's Bray's translation. And so that intrigued me because the, the advice really seems so much like my own world in a way. I mean, um, that sort of dry, cynical, uh, uh, hardworking ethic that I that I saw there with a very practical eye and a, and a very realistic eye about what people are like. It reminded me so much of just you know cowboy literature and, and people like my grandfather. 
Uh, and I went and I tracked down the Olive Gray translation. I think that's the first one I read in English. Um, and as soon as I had learned Old Norse for myself, I mean, the first thing I was trying to read was Havamal. Um, so by the time I was 19, I guess, um, I probably had Havamal practically memorized in Old Norse. Um, and from that point on, I think after that, I went and I, I tried reading. So, you know, it'd been years since I'd probably seen an English translation. And I went looking at some of the different English translations because I was starting to think, to think about teaching this text. And um, I was just so dissatisfied with them because, you know, part of it is the stilted language and it re does not read stilted in Old Norse at all. Um, and, and part of it too is that Holmall is giving advice in a third person way when in English we give advice in the second person. So like, um, uh, like I'm trying to think of a, a, a stanza is a good example of this. Um, I think in stanza nine, there is a comment about um, the person is happy who has uh, praise and intelligence inside of himself. So that's just, that's, that's a typical way of expressing a thought like that in, Old Norse. In English, you might rephrase that in the second person. You'll be happy if you have praise and intelligence inside yourself. Um, so in a fair amount of Havamal, not, not the whole thing, but I often took those advice stanzas and I turned them from third person to second person because it's just how we communicate advice again. Um, there's often not a clear subject in uh, advice in Old Norse. Sometimes you'll just have the verb skal, shall, doesn't say a person doesn't say you or one, but in English, we can't just, we can't say that. We can't say, you know, shall go. We have to say you must go or you shall go. So uh, just being sort of familiar with how advice is dispensed in English. And especially since so much of it reminded me of my grandfather's advice, I, uh, I tried to rework it into what sounds like, um, you know, not haranguing advice, but the kind of advice uh, that you would get. And then of course, it's all, it, she would get naturally in English. And then, of course, there's also the cowboy hall mall where I especially try to imitate my grandfather's voice directly, um, I think, fairly successfully. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask about, about that. Uh, and, well, and, and now, now, you've, uh, now you've said how this, the cowboy hall mall kind of came about, and that's, that's fantastic that it's based on your grandfather. That's uh, no better way to, uh, to honor uh, someone's memory, I think. I hope so. He never lived to see it. Uh, I did that in one night, the Cowboy Hall Mall, uh, in January 2012. Um, there was a, um, a Norwegian blogger who had made Hall Mall for Dummies, uh, rephrasing Hall Mall in just two words of Norwegian for each stanza. So, like, shut up for a stanza that's about not talking too much. It was actually, it was well done. But he had made a blog post about how he didn't think there was anybody who wasn't Scandinavian who had a personal enough relationship with the text to do something like that. And I said, I will take that bet. <laughs> and uh, that was the night I composed the Cowboy Havamal. Yeah, I think I remember seeing the Cowboy Havamal making the rounds on the internet before your translation came out. For And you released it on the internet, right? Yes, it's it's uh, it predates my normal translation of the Portugueta by three years of public availability. Um, and Hackett, uh, actually liked it a lot for the, just the tone of it. Cause it, it is, I think, very authentic in tone to the original in a way that it's hard to do with my somewhat more, uh, quote unquote, normal translation. Uh, so we did work out a deal where it would be an appendix in my published translation, but I could also, um, I could make it available on the internet. Of course, people steal it and put it in other places. Um, but Hacken and I do have a special deal where I can, I can have the whole text on the internet and I've read it a couple times in videos and, and I think I'm going to get the, uh, audiobook file too. So I might be able to put that online before the audiobook comes out. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And it sounds pretty good. I think, um, you know, I'm sitting there recording the audiobook. I'm in a professional recording studio. Uh, with a twelve thousand dollar microphone in my face, just sound engineers and you know adjusting eighty, ninety different dials, it sounds crisp. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's uh, that's the dream for us one day. 
Well, it's, it's really cool. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, I feel like a rock star in there with all the cool equipment. So uh, you said something interesting about the, uh, the mythology book that you read by, uh, was it Edith? Edith Hamilton. Edith Hamilton, where it focused mostly on uh, like Greek and you said uh, Roman? Yeah, well, you know, of course, we have this traditional conception of Greek and Roman myth as being pretty much the same. Um, and that, so it really was Greek myth and a little bit of the Roman, um, the Roman stuff like Ovid. Um, of course, if you really go back in time, there is a, there is a really distinct Roman myth from Greek myth, but that's not what that book is about. For sure. But it made me think, cause you, you said it like the Havel was basically, or Norse mythology was sort of like postscript to, to the book. Uh, and I know if, uh, like if I think of my time in school and university, everything was, uh, you know, Greek mythology or sort of hist like we'd say like Eastern history. So uh, maybe Hindu or Indian mythology, that kind of thing. And the, um, the Norse and European stuff didn't really uh, get much attention, but I, I think it's, it might be changing a bit. And I was wondering if you had any, observations or insight on on that i definitely think it's changing uh i think part of what's happened is that greek and roman myth is so often encountered in school and we have often for years after uh our school years sort of an extinctive boredom with anything we encountered in school uh i mean i know i it it took me years after high school to want to read anything by an author I'd been assigned in high school because it was taught in such a boring way. Uh, but Norse myth not being taught in school very much, I think has intrigued people uh, just for that reason, but also because there is such a mystery to it. I think the very fact that you can't answer every question in old Norse myth, um, there's so many gaps uh, is part of the appeal that it is mysterious. It feels like there's this larger world and you're just getting a, a taste of it. It's actually a lot like what J.R.R. Tolkien very successfully does in, in, in his fiction uh, is paint this deeper world that you're really just, you're, you're part of that history. But of course, you can't go back and learn all these 20,000 years of history or whatever that he has in his head. I think just that very mystery is part of what draws people. They feel like... Um, you know, it, I, I think it gives a certain amount of lease to the imagination. And also, of course, there's been a lot of popular media drawing on um, on Norse mythology lately uh, or Norse subjects like Vikings. I mean, there's the Vikings TV show. There's the huge success of the Avengers movies with Thor being a really central character. Um, the Lord of the Rings movies, I think, drew a lot of people to this. I definitely saw a bump in people taking Old English and Old Norse classes uh, starting around. Uh, the early 2000s when uh, when those movies came out. Uh, so there, there's that. And now I'm in a position where um, uh, my contract at the University of Colorado requires me to teach uh, one class of 150 or more students every semester. And I have zero problems with any of my classes filling that much. In fact, uh, I can teach a class of 180 in Norse mythology and at the beginning, the first few weeks of class, there'll still be a wait list of 180 to get into that class that's already full to 180. People are fascinated by this stuff. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think it's a combination of a lot of factors. I think it's that mystery. I think it's uh, the exposure in popular culture. And I think also a little bit of the tone is more consonant with uh, our time, the 2010s, than it is with, say, the mid 20th century. Um, you know, I, I think uh, the tone attitude of, of cultures kind of goes up and down, maybe in a cycle and in a time that is sort of fatalistic an attitude, not that the mid 20th century wasn't, but uh, there's this sort of, I don't know, uh, grim grimness to our fatalism right now that I think is reflected in a lot of, uh, of, of Norse myth. You know, it, 
it's interesting you say that because uh, because certainly I think for for me personally there, there's something about it that that really resonates and I mean well well I'd been interested in this stuff for for a really long time before thinking I might want to you know try and talk about it on a podcast sort of thing but uh, you know, there was there was just something to it that uh, that seemed to resonate and I, I'd never thought about kind of the the connection to our time quite that way. You think there's anything else to, you know, maybe um, people trying to connect to something from the past that, uh, w- well, it was sort of forcibly um, tucked away for a while, thankfully written down, but, uh, you know, there was certainly that period of time where you know, the Scandinavian and all that, it was, it well, still is Christian today, but the do you think there's anything to that? People kind of looking past beyond Christianity for for some meaning that isn't connected with that. I, I think there could be a little bit of a forbidden fruit phenomenon. Um, actually, less in Scandinavia than in English speaking and German speaking countries. Um, you know, a lot of the resurgence they uh, in, already in kind of in the early modern period, Scandinavians were beginning to become more aware of this stuff. Um, in the 1600s, 1700s, you had a big scramble by Denmark and Sweden to see which one could collect the most Old Norse manuscripts in Iceland. Um, they were getting pretty interested in it. Part of what led to the resurgence of interest in the English and German speaking countries was um, actually it kind of ties in with the resurgence of interest in linguistics. Um, as people became aware of how these languages are connected, um, there's also this uh, quest, especially in the 19th century and very romantic period to figure out, um, you know, like what is the quote unquote original or older culture of the speakers of whatever language. And because, um, the only Germanic speaking countries where the myths were written down in a cohesive way was Scandinavia, uh, you start getting, that's when you really get this rush of translations into English and German, um, because the English and German are speakers are in a sense trying to kind of claim this. And of course, probably the gods worshipped in pre-Christian England, the Netherlands, Germany uh, would have been similar. They would have had cognate names. We can't be sure that, for instance, there was a you know an English Havamal or, or a German Voluspa. The, the specific myths may have been very different. But since it was the most closely related thing they could find, it got, it got more popular there. And I think there's you know, the, the Lord of the Rings is sort of part of that because J.R.R. Tolkien was trying to construct a I think he even said this on mythology for England and he was um, drawing on a lot of influences from um, that, that Scandinavian world and also from, from Finnish stuff, which isn't as closely related, but he liked it. Yeah. We, we, we certainly appreciate his, uh, his fondness for the, the Finnish mythology. Yeah. It's his, his, uh, uh, the Silmarillion uh, has so much Edda in it, but also so much Kalevala in it. Um, and of course the Kalevala, I don't, no finish. Um, but I enjoy those stories and they have a very different tone from Norse myth. I, I think I've wandered away from your original question. <laughs> oh, maybe not. And, uh, we certainly don't mind, uh, going down the rabbit hole sometimes, but, uh, no, no, I, I, I certainly, uh, agree with the, the idea that there might be that missing mythology there. And, uh, are you familiar with, um, Grimm's Teutonic mythology. I thought he was was sort of trying to do something similar with the with the German specifically, collecting a lot of folklore there. Oh yeah, and he's also a huge linguist. Uh, Jakob and Wilhelm Grimm, um, of course, is Grimm's Law, uh, named for um, I think specifically Jakob, um, which shows how consonants in Germanic languages are related to consonants in other Indo-European languages. Um, you know, during the nineteenth century, a lot of that that romantic nationalism was tied up with a sort of linguistic nationalism uh, that also um, involved trying to figure out the connections between these languages. Uh, and of course that had negative effects too. I mean, a lot of that got tied up with, with racist ideas, um, but it's part of what it's, it's part of the origins of the excitement about these things in uh, English speaking countries to this day. I mean, you can find very nice editions of like, um, uh, Bray's translation of, of the, the poetic Edda from the first decade of the 1900s. Uh, people are already excited about it. I think, you know, I, I'm in trying to account for why it's so overwhelmingly popular today. I think popular culture is a big 
a big part of that because popular culture uh, outside of certain circles didn't get really into Norse stuff in the English speaking world before pretty recently. Um, and it still surprises people. I mean, uh, university administrators included just how much interest there is in this. Um, and a lot of people want to see the original sources and, um, Part of what I'm trying to do, of course, with my translations is make those available in a way that they can read um, that, that's not so distracting with the, the, the way that it's written in archaic English. Well, it's certainly a, a worthy endeavor. Thank you. I managed to, I managed to segue back to, <laughs> to <Yeah>. my books. <laughs> well, I think uh, we don't want to keep you too long here, and, and certainly we've appreciated your insights into... Well, first of all, your your process with the the poetic edda, with uh, all the the related things that kind of have spawned out from that. Um, maybe we'll uh, we'll just leave you with uh, maybe one more um, one more thing, kind of related to this to this last topic. Uh, why do you think it's important to to look at this stuff and study it, whether it, it be the the languages or the the mythology? Why is it important for you or in general? shall we say? Well, you know, I think a lot of it just has to do with the, uh, the famous quote, um, who knows only his generation remains always a child. Um, human nature really hasn't changed. It's fairly stable. I think understanding the most beautiful and most perceptive um, understandings of that from the past uh, and those aren't just Norse. I mean, um, you can get uh, wonderful treatises on the human condition in in Greek and Hebrew and in the Waddle in Chinese. Uh, I think understanding these really helps uh, to position ourselves within a a continuity of humanity that doesn't reject the past. And I feel like right now our cultural moment is too often very close to, to rejecting and very harshly judging the past when, I mean, it's people just like us who were just put in different conditions, um, but who reacted and behaved just as we do. I, I think we're so tempted now to explain everything um, in such a scientific way that we forget that human beings are very unscientific creatures. And uh, these these older literatures, I think, are very important in, in reminding us um, of what we actually are and I think also sort of centering us, um, you know, our current moment is not the be all end all of humanity. We have been through these struggles before in only slightly different guises. Um, I think as far as a language goes, of course, it's a personal decision to study something like Old Norse um, that in 9,000 cases out of 9,001 is not gonna have something to do with your career. Uh, but if a text like Halvamal, you know, in, in my case, particularly speaks to you, I think that understanding what it says in the original is very valuable, um, partially because, of course, any translation is going to be an act of, of some creation. I mean, every, every translator has to make decisions um, that are never going to exactly render exactly word for word what you're going to see in the original, uh, getting an understanding of that language and its literary traditions helps you understand why something might be phrased the particular way it is. Uh, and it often will be different from uh, your own cultural framework. And uh, just, just being able to, to sort of have that touchstone and, uh, and, and understand how something is, is phrased and constructed in another language is I think a great value to understanding other languages that are very, um, conversational based language learning today often skips over, right? Just because you can say como esta does not mean that you can construct a thought in all the different ways that Spanish makes you construct it. And being able to do that well gives you a better appreciation for how a thought might be constructed in your own language. It might make you a better writer, a better communicator. I certainly think that studying other languages has made my English um, uh, clearer and more conscious. And I think we just we just forget that the way we teach both ancient and modern languages today. I, that that is an awesome answer on both counts, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, the connection to that past, but also that understanding of 
you know, this is this is a way that people lived in the past and a different way of understanding. I, I love that, and I, I've I've heard that before about learning a second language is uh, is a good way to make you think in a different way. So no, that's that's really wonderful. Well, and, and if I can add an, an appendix to that, um, you know, you go to something like a Rinfest and you see people dressed up as Vikings. Uh, and there's, of course, a big subculture of people today who kind of want to be Vikings. And so often it includes basically signs of material culture. What does your hair look like? What does your beard look like? What do your clothes look like? But, you know, it always strikes me that very rarely does this go along with serious study of the language. And that's where you actually see how a people thinks, right? I mean, your hairstyle is going to be outdated 10 years from now. And you're never going to imitate something that's exactly like what a Viking wore because their hairstyles probably change every 10 years. Uh, but how a language makes you ask someone how they're doing, how a language um, shapes the way that you think about, you know, how the sun rises, uh, what words a language makes you say as you transition from statement to question, um, you know, all these things actually make you kind of dig into an alternate way of thinking. And I think that's how you really touch the past, not, not the clothes you wear. And, um, you know, that's, that's where actual non-superficial, uh, uh, cross, uh, cultural and cross-generational understanding happens. I think. I love that. Yeah, really that's fantastic. No, and, uh, I couldn't, agree, couldn't agree more, honestly. Um, well, I, I think uh, we don't want to keep you too much longer here. And, uh, of course, you've got a lot of, uh, you, well, you've mentioned some of them here. Uh, you've got a lot going on here, projects and, and that. Do you want to let us know about anything you have coming up? Well, the audiobook for the Poetic Edda will be available November 13th. Um, I think it can already be pre-ordered on Downpour and I think even on Amazon now. Um, I've got... Uh, my third book I'm working on, that's the Saga of Rolf Kraki and the Saga of Hereborn Hatherick, two more uh, of the mythical sagas. There'll be a good uh, companion book for the Saga of the Volsungs, the Saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. And then after that, for much of 2019, I'll be working on translating the prose edda. Um, I'll be actually, uh, I've already planned out how I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it in the order Snorri probably wrote it in, which is sort of backwards. I'm going to translate Hotetal, Skoldskapramal, and then finally Gilvaginning, the part that really gets into myth, because um, that's probably how he did it. Uh, and I think that'll help. And also that way the myth part will be a reward after translating all the lists of Kinning. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm also my translation of the prose is going to include um, Inglinga Saga, which is... Um, sort of Snorri's other book about myth, which often gets forgotten, but which is a source of a lot of uh, material you can't get anywhere else, like um, what he says about the Asir Vanir War and uh, some very interesting early um, kings of the Swedes and Norwegians who make interesting decisions like uh, wagers with Odin about, or not wagers, but deals packs with Odin about uh, living longer by sacrificing their kids and stuff like that. It's some wild stories. That's uh, that's not just a, a minor addendum there. That's uh, oh, I think we're gonna be we're well, yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Absolutely, this is can't wait. Yeah, a lot of translations of the prose edda do not include the whole prose edda, and I don't know of another one that does include Ingling a saga. So I think that's gonna be um, it's it's gonna be a little something special, uh, and and of course, uh, that's in a lot of demand, probably more than the sagas are, but that's just uh, the order that we ended up signing these contracts in. No, that well, that's uh, that reality is certainly fair enough. Certainly looking forward to uh, everything you have coming up, and uh, you know you have an open invitation to uh, come back on the show if you'd like to talk about uh, anything you have uh, going on when it's released. So, well, thank you. This is this has been a, a a really good conversation, and and thanks for your great questions. And uh, as I said, I'm honored by your use of my translation on your show. <laughs> well, we're I think we're, we're honored uh, too. So that, you know, you're on our show, and that we're able to use it. So it, it's mutual. And if if you uh, if you want to just just stick around here, we have kind of a, a 
a usual ending here that is kind of uh, ballooning as we keep on adding more more things to mention. But if you don't mind, uh, five minutes here and we can recap with you afterwards. Okay, well, uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Crawford, for for joining us. And just to uh, just to wrap up, we'll we'll mention uh, again all the different ways you can get a hold of us and the the couple of ways you can support the show if you'd like to do that. So again, we are on Twitter and Facebook as Northern Myths, and we are Northern Myths Podcast on Instagram and YouTube. We're also personally on Twitter, North Myth Luke and North Myth Dan. And uh, of course, uh, we've mentioned our YouTube channel as well. And uh, if you'd like to uh, go over there for some more clips of the the show, as well as all of our episodes are on YouTube. And uh, we'd appreciate to subscribe or a share on social media on any of these things. If you'd like to do that, that is definitely one of the best ways to support the show. As well, we've got a couple of new things starting up. We've got a recommended books page on our website now, which you can find a lot of the the literature that, first of all, that we cover on our show, but also that we have used as our, uh, what's the word, uh, inspiration and uh, backup material for a lot of the ideas we talk about. So, uh, And we, we do have uh, Amazon affiliate links on all of our recommended books. And that's one of the easiest ways you can help support the show if you like. Just a little bit of your purchase goes towards us. And we do have a, a new merchandise store based on popular demand. So you can find that on our website as well. And we'll have a link to that in our description below and the podcast notes. Just a few t-shirts at the beginning here. And uh, we'll see if we decide to expand that out to anything else. But of course, that's a great way to support the podcast and represent the show if you care to do that am i forgetting anything dan well i would like uh just to give another uh shout out and thanks to uh hackett publishing and uh dr jackson crawford for the poetic ed and letting us use it it's a it's a huge help and it's as we've talked about in this episode incredibly clear and readable and it captures the spirit of the of what's being said in the poem so it's fantastic and other than that uh sort of the most important thing for all of us uh, is to uh, go out and find the myth you're living. This has been the Northern Mist Podcast. Thank you very much.